welcome everybody. Thank you again for another live session. My name is Manny Fragilis, and uh, today we're fortunate to have the man, Michael Pavlovich. Did I butcher that, Mike? You nailed it. <laughs> right on, right on. <laughs> so um, Michael is uh, taking time you know, off of work to talk to us about um, ZBrush. Um, uh, um, uh, as usual, just highlighting um, just his overall experience um, using the software over the you know last several years, and some of the amazing work that he's you know done on Halo uh, and a couple of other projects that we can't get into. Um, so he's teaching an introduction to ZBrush class uh, for CGMA. Um, definitely feel free to check that out. Um, I'll also be sending you guys. Uh, I'll be posting a link to to the class page for you guys uh, so you can take a look at that. Um, but uh, you, obviously, you guys are going to come here to hear me talk, so I'm going to hand it over to Mike. Mike, take it away. All right. Thanks, everybody, for showing up. Um, I'm going to start. I'm, I'm not going to give you my whole history because I think as we get to my later history, uh, I'm going to be answering questions that kind of go into that. But uh, if I go early, uh, I graduated Ringling School of Art and Design in 2005, and we don't need to look at my old stuff, really. But um, I started out... Um, as a computer animation major, and then I went up the road from Sarasota to Orlando to work at EA Tiburon, and I worked there for a couple years. Uh, Madden head coach, NCAA back when they still had NCAA, and I uh, learned a lot there. Uh, got my feet wet in the industry, and then from there I went to go work at DC Universe Online, um, in which is an Austin company, uh, formerly Sony Online Entertainment. And this was my first introduction to like a ZBrush centric pipeline. And we did a ton of really cool stuff. Like here's my first hard edge model in ZBrush. Some of it's a little dated. Some of it's a little embarrassing to look at. And But the cool thing was we made like 10,000 assets uh, through ZBrush with a pretty tight character pipeline and all over the place, like hard edge, plastic dolls and clothes and zombies. And that was a really, really good experience to kind of get me prepared for it's the problem is basically getting me prepared for problem solving in a pipeline with a bunch of tools that uh, I've found very, very useful as I've gone through my career. Uh, while I was at DC Universe Online working on that, um, I did some videos for E3D uh, back in the day. These are a little bit dated, but they're still uh, fairly relevant a little bit. Um, we did some cool stuff like, you know, print out this guy. This is back when 3D printing was way new like you had to save out your little stereo lithographic file and zbrush didn't have all the cool uh stl import and export and saving and it was a long time ago i did a gears of war statue and i did that statue uh gears of war statue i did for mind's eye and uh, it was a really cool good experience um also well now we're getting into the little bit of the later not this is you know, five, six years old right now, but now we're starting to get into a little bit later stuff. I went from Sony Online Entertainment to Certain Affinity, and Certain Affinity's a, you know, they do their own games like uh, Crimson Alliance and Age of Booty, but we also do a lot of co-development, like most notably Halo, Call of Duty, and like Manny said, a bunch of other stuff I'm not allowed to talk about. Uh, but that's part of the deal with co-development, is you gotta kind of wait for everything to get settled before you can talk about stuff, but really cool projects, believe me. And... I think we're all caught up. Cool. Perfect. All right. So uh, we'll just jump directly right into the questions. Uh, guys, if you have any questions uh, for Mike, we already have a few queued up. Uh, definitely feel free to just post them uh, on that chat window. All right. So um, first question, how do I start working in ZBrush? Uh, there's a lot of stuff, uh, you know, and sometimes there's a lot of stuff in it. And sometimes it confuses me and I drop the idea about learning it. Yes. Uh, like I mentioned in my intro to ZBrush video, which uh, is for free um, on my YouTube channel, as well as on Gumroad, if you want to download the files, it's eight hours. And I start off, and the reason I, it's kind of just to get your feet wet, and it's a very linear progression. I know a lot of times when you show somebody like an intro video or an intro course to a certain piece of software, sometimes they tend to just overwhelm you with like options and if you've ever seen zbrush you know it gets real overwhelming real fast once you start opening these menus up um i could totally see why somebody would want to go in here and go all right dude what what do you really expect me to do with all of this stuff you know i believe me i get it and i had to learn it myself so i think and you know go and watch it and tell me if i'm wrong but i think the intro to zbrush course though this is like 47 videos and 
it basically just gets your feet wet in a way that isn't overwhelming, you know, and it's, there, it's kind of hard for me too, because there's so much cool stuff and solutions in ZBrush, because ZBrush is an incredibly powerful, basically modeling solutions tool. You don't just approach a problem from one angle, like, oh, you have to extrude a face. Not in ZBrush. You can do 75 different ways to solve a problem, which is a good thing, but also a terrifying thing to a beginner. So it's hard for me to teach an intro to ZBrush course sometimes. That's why I laid the videos the way I did, is because it forced me to kind of keep it, hey, load up a sphere. Just grab a brush. Here's navigation, a little bit of transpose, a little bit of brushes, a standard brush, clay brush, move brush. And I will tell you, after you've used a standard brush, standard brush move brush, and clay brush, uh, you'll get to the point where, enter the ZBrush part one, you should be able to go ahead and just whip out, let me grab this, you know, a bust sculpt and you know, just kind of concept in ZBrush and you can, you can sculpt anything. Now, does that mean it's refined? Does that mean you know all the tools and all the tricks to do a production model? No, but at least by the end, you should be comfortable enough to get around ZBrush. You won't be like, man, two hours in and I'm already completely lost. This program is horrible. It's the worst thing ever made. It, it's a terrible, you know, layout or whatever people say about ZBrush. Um, and I think something that turns people off from ZBrush too is that it's very uh, super artist oriented. So a lot of people, it's actually easier for me to teach somebody who doesn't know 3D ZBrush than it is for me to teach somebody who's learned 3D and they've been using 3D for the past 20 years and then they want to use ZBrush because they immediately almost have that mentality of wanting to kind of shut down once they realize that extrude face thing they've been doing for 20 years is in a weird location or maybe doesn't make sense to them and they immediately just kind of lock up. But um, I've had really good success with people who are just kind of brand new and they just eat ZBrush up like crazy. Cool. All right, so um, next question is, average time for a character fully produced through the pipeline and number of people working on one character? Um, for example, this lovely lady probably took me, you know, and this is from concept to final uh, sculpts, probably two weeks. And, you know, I say two weeks, I wasn't working from a concept, so that's me kind of figuring stuff out and kind of uh, playing around with the ideas and the shapes and the silhouette and the forms and the ideas and the details. And then doing the game res is probably another, you know, retopologizing, bake my mask, probably another week. And then getting it in and texturing it. I mean, with the new tools like Substance Painter and stuff, man, you can get a, you can get a really nice texture job done in like a couple hours, you know, depending on how well set up you are with... Uh, you know, your smart materials and your uh, texturing pipeline setup that you have. Um, I'm not, obviously, this is an intro to ZBrush course, but if you're so inclined, I do have some intro stuff. Um, so, like, on my YouTube videos, I have um, Substance Designer Quick Start, Substance Painter Quick Start, even Fusion 360, um, which is another program that people are kind of like, it's weird. It's, you know, I, I like learning tools. I like learning new things. That's my favorite thing in the world to do. So I kind of try and branch out as much as I can. Um, but, you know, if you are interested in that kind of stuff, the next step of production, you can certainly go check that out. But long story short, if I'm really feeling it, I got a good concept or somebody hands me a 3D concept, I can knock out a character this resolution and this fidelity in a week. Um, if it's me concepting and kind of playing around and it's an hour at night, it might take me a little longer, but um, it's ZBrush is pretty quick. Cool. And how many people are working on one character? Oh, well, I mean, for the model now, and it, the, the things that I've worked on, it's been models and textures by the character artist. Um, of course, depending on the studio you work at, it could be models by one or pieces of the models by one, yeah. um, textures by another whole group. You throw that over the wall to animation. Um, on DCUO, actually, it was a really, really tight pipeline. So the character artist actually did all of the rigging, all of the physics for the cloth, all of the weighting, all of the um, modeling textures, and all the pieces and goon generation, all of that was handled by the character artist. Obviously, that's not the norm, but it can be done. And it was actually a pretty sweet um, experience. Yeah, definitely. I think uh, I think for games, you guys uh, tend to, um, you know, 
it's it, it's usually just one artist working on you know the entire character. Uh, for some films, it gets a little bit more you know it gets a little bit more complex where you have uh, you could have multiple artists working on the exact same character. Um, especially it's like you know with films, if you're working on different shots, different sequences, uh, different production studios, um, so it tends to be a little bit more complicated in that sense. Sure. So, all right, cool. Uh, what did you find most challenging in learning to be a good char character artist and what uh, advice um, to use learning now? <sighs> I find challenging. It, it, it's, it's hard for me to speak in terms of like what was challenging just because <laughs> it's going to sound bad. Everything is a challenge to me. And that might be why I like to teach is because I've already made all the mistakes. Like you can't out mistake me. You can't out mess something up or learn a bad process and, but learn from it, obviously. Um, so, I mean, everything's a challenge, uh, but I love, love, love what I do. So even though it's a challenge, the reward of actually overcoming that challenge and learning new stuff is so rewarding that it almost doesn't even, I don't even think of it as a challenge. It's all a challenge, but at the same time, none of it, it's not really a challenge. You just got to sit down and do it. And character creation is no different than props, is no different than environments and that it's mostly just observation. You know, you've got, I mean, there's ins and outs and design principles and all that kind of stuff. But at the end of the day, you just have to look at something, create it, learn from it, and, uh, you know, hold on to that visual language as much as you can and just kind of absorb it and then apply that to whatever you're working on. Be that, if you can model a fire hydrant, you can model a shoulder pad, you can model a human face. Now, again, like there's ins and outs and there's a little bit of technique stuff and there's a little bit of learning beyond just observation and being able to extrapolate observation to, you know, concepting or different character types or visual storytelling as you're creating a character that's really important. But I mean, at the end of the day, just sit down, do it and learn from what you do. Most importantly. Cool. Great. Um, I mean, what is this question? I've talked with Epic studios that fabric creation is key to character creation. Do you have any tips? Uh, like marvelous designer type stuff? Yeah. Um, yeah, for uh, for sure. Um, uh, so marvelous designer, I have used marvelous designer, and it is really really solid program. Um, I don't know how much I should talk about this, but I am looking into developing other solutions that's more game friendly, if you know what I mean. Um, I mean, yeah. Marvelous Designer, is, it's like I have to be a seamstress to be really good at Marvelous Designer, which is fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but if I can just make a pair of 3D pants and then start doing some, you know, like, like Maya and cloth, you can just go in there and apply cloth and it's a little bit of hoops to jump through. Um, but at the end of the day, I'd rather not have to be a seamstress in order to apply cloth to my character. And now that's not to say Marvelous Designer is a bad tool. Um, it's a great tool. Um, but it does seem a little bit limiting to me uh, on some pipeline stuff, but uh, yeah. it isn't, I would say, yeah, uh, to answer your question, it is important. I mean, if you want to have really good pair of look, good looking pair of jeans, I mean, you can sculpt it and maybe, I mean, it's good practice, but at the end of the day, especially if game pipelines, you need a hundred pairs of jeans that all look great. A cloth sim is a really, really good tool. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree. Uh, and Marvel, I think with with Marvelous Designer, they're constantly improving uh, on some of that workflow because I think it started, you know, not more for fashion industry, but definitely you can see the use case for it. And and a lot of that, it's like you know, in terms of all the different pattern, you know, making is just to uh, achieve more realistic, um, you know, simulations. So yes. um, there's definitely like a learning curve, but that's the same thing with any software. Um, but uh, but yeah. Uh, but as, as as Michael mentioned, um, just, yeah, uh, fabric creation, I guess, is definitely a huge part of that, you know, in terms of creating believable characters. But um, with that, so is anatomy <laughs> and sculpting a face and everything else that comes with it. So, um, all right, speaking of sculpting, how do you approach hard surface uh, portions of a character, armor, et cetera, et cetera? Do you use Z-Modeler or uh, other approaches? I use everything, man. I like to approach... Um, a prob see what happens when you and nothing to get specialists but what happens when you specialize sometimes is you have 
uh, a problem. And if you only, the only way to solve that problem is your hammer, all your problems, all your solutions are going to be a hammer and all your problems are going to be a nail. And that's the old, you know, adage, um, cliche there. But you know, what happens is you can end up, you know, if you have a, I mean, I'm not talking like a hammer that's a poor hammer. I'm talking like Thor's hammer with leather wrapping and it's made of titanium and it's got gold inlay. It's a nice hammer, but try zipping up your jacket with a hammer. Try rebuilding an engine with a hammer. Try doing, you know, putting on a, installing a doorknob with a hammer. It's going to be embarrassing. So, you know, it's tough to say, you know, approach. This is your one approach to hard edge modeling. I would use everything in, to your advantage. Now, ZBrush specifically, um, I can do. I can kind of do a little bit of demo later, but I do have some of that stuff already on my YouTube channel. And it's not like step by step. Here's here's how you do this. Here's how you do that. But it's kind of just like an overview of, uh, for example, my mech helmet. You know, I go through the entire concept uh, thing where it's like. Here's me, oops, let me need this. Here's me just kind of blocking in the shapes and refining the shapes all the way up until we get to, you know, this stuff here. Well, I guess I can just go ahead and load that up here. Uh, let's see, where's my mech helmet? Here it is. All the way up. In, and now this was done 100% in ZBrush. And it was done 100% in ZBrush like five or six years ago. Um, for, I mean, I didn't do it for Quixel, but if you want to like download this thing and go and texture it, you can go to the, um, you can just Google. Oh, my own last name. Evlovich Quixel. Um, you go to the DDU samples and you can just download this helmet and texture it up however you want. Like so, there it is. Um, but yeah, that was hundred percent ZBrush. That was, this is actually back before Z modeler. Now at this point, you know, I like the concept in ZBrush. I mean, I will start with nothing. I will start with a sphere with a low res dynamesh and just get my shapes in order. Actually, I got this really nicely broken down. If you Google, uh, GDC 2015 Pavlovich, um, you will find, um, it's, I think it's called remaking the art of halo Two, And it's, it's a video that GDC live GameSpot live streamed it, and I think GDC it's never been in the vault, so you can just go watch it anytime. And basically, if you want to see the step by step process, um, it starts out, you know, uh, talking about the ZBrush process. So here's my rough sketch, and then here it is, like me just figuring out shapes. And I'm not talking like this is going to take me three or four hours of exploration. This is like one minute of exploration. This is like five minutes of exploration. Now, once we start narrowing it down, this is a little bit tighter. Okay, 15 minutes of exploration, kind of refining it. Breaking it apart is pretty simple. Um, just as I'm refining, I'm kind of detailing my shapes out. And then at this point, I can actually kind of explore and see how things work, move it around. And it's still very, very, it, it's, it's nothing. Like if I back away from it, it looks pretty good. And that's the cool thing about this is that you can evaluate something that looks hard edge but then when you get up on it, it's like it's soft and goopy, but it, you're solving problems and you're uh, looking at it in a way that's quick and you evaluate it. And then before you put in all that time and you extrapolate it to this and it's like, I've got all this modeled in. If you do this first and then you get it in game and everybody goes, oh, uh, it doesn't work on the rig. Oh, the silhouette sucks. Oh, it doesn't work with the environment. It's too busy or it's not busy enough or whatever. You wasted a lot of time. So actually what this presentation ends up being mostly about is just evaluating in the end result. Here it is going through all the way through the process here. And then, you know, you bake your maps, but um, you get, you end up just evaluating it in engine. And the reason we do that is for example, same thing, same exact same, same thing with the uh, GDC female, sketch it out real quick, sketch refine. This might take me a couple hours and then I can get it in the game like right away, like this thing right here, I can get in in half a day and start evaluating in engine. Uh, and the reason why that's cool is because once you're in engine, and this is obviously just an unreal test scene, but it, here's my sketch. That's my goopy, gross, nothing sketch. That, that thing right there. But here's my sketch refine. Form refine. Do you see anything really changing? Like really? The cool thing about this is design can go in there and go, hey, there's not enough white, there's not enough black, uh, there's not enough red, we wanna change it completely while I'm still sketching it. Uh, but then when I start refining it and everybody's already looked at it, they can go, 
I mean, it looks great on the sketch refine. And then by the time I'm done with all that crazy detail, nobody's surprised. Nobody's like, dude, you spent three months on that. It's garbage. It's like, no, there, there's nothing going on. that's going to go off the rails. Um, but I already forgot the question, so I hope that answered it. <laughs> this is about just the, you know, just hard surface. You just your approach to um, uh, hard surface, uh, you know, uh, characters or the hard hard surface portion of a character. And with that being said, because uh, there's a lot of interest, um, a lot of questions and a lot of interest on that. Obviously, you know, your work, um, you know, in terms of a lot of the stuff that we see is, is, you know, deals a great deal with that. And obviously there's a lot of good sense of master, master, mastery mastery <laughs> when it comes to that so haven't had my my, my breakfast like yet so uh what uh what i was getting to is um would you be able you know michael to do like a five minute demo um really simple shapes in terms of how you would approach you know hard surface and zbrush sure uh you want to do that at the end so i can i want to keep this stuff loaded so i can kind of switch between them but at the yeah, very exactly. end i can yeah. do yeah. yeah oh that's perfectly fine that would be great awesome so, yeah, I can do that. perfect um, so moving along, what is the best way to make a low poly model after making it uh, high poly in ZBrush? Um, uh, the best way would be to have somebody else do it because it's really boring. But having said <laughs> that, um, I do like to retopologize in ZBrush, actually. I, I use, uh, like I said, I use everything. I've used Moto, 3D Coat, Maya. I haven't used 3D Studio Max, but it's I could probably figure it out. Um, Topo Gun, ZBrush. Blender, uh, I miss one. You know, there's a million ways to retopologize something. Uh, but at the end of the day, you're just plotting points and building an envelope to bake high res textures to. So it's kind of, and even at my company, almost everybody uses a different modeling package and a different retopologizing solution. Like, it's not like a one thing. You, you come work at our company and you have to use Maya. It's like, no, it's a model. You can use whatever you want. Now, pipeline, that's different. You do have to know a certain 3D package, in our case, Maya, in order to get things through the pipeline. But as far as just modeling source assets, it's kind of almost agnostic uh, nowadays, I think. Yeah, I, I would agree with you. Yeah, I completely agree. So I've, I uh, use everything. <laughs> and cool. zero. Cool. So uh, knowing a bit of the basics, what would be the easiest way to start working on a simple game character? I know there are more than one way to uh, one ways to approach it, uh, but what would you suggest uh, for a, just a simple game character, like for like an indie game where it's like a side you know platformer side scrolling thing? Um, you got to start with your sketch. Now I tend to sketch in ZBrush. So it's a 3D sketch. And the reason I like the 3D sketch in ZBrush is because I'm answering, you know how, you know how they say uh, a picture is worth a thousand words? Well, a 3D model is kind of like a thousand pictures. If a concept artist handed you a thousand pictures, you could run that through photo scan and just photogrammetry the damn thing. But when you're sketching in 3D, you're already answering silhouette. And as it turns, you're being able to evaluate the form in the round. Um, so I would say hop, the easiest way for me, hop in a ZBrush and just sketch it out in, in 3D. And I mean, you use Dynamesh and it really, it ends up being clay brush, move brush, standard brush. Maybe you want to get fancy and use trim dynamic and Damien standard or clay buildup. You know, it's, it's not rocket science, but um, sketch it out, um, bake it off and then get, you know, you would have to talk to, I mean, if you're a rigger, th that goes beyond my area of expertise. I've always had really good tech artists and really good riggers doing that. So I haven't really done that since college, but talk to them about getting like good animatable edge loops and wet painting weights and all that stuff to make it a viable end game asset. But to start off man, just sketch it out in 3d. Cool. And it was a two part question. The other part is, um, another question after so many years working in ZBrush, is it still addictive? <laughs> oh, dude, totally. <laughs> like here, here's the crazy thing is like, even if my, my nine to five job was like, sketching around in ZBrush and making cool stuff, I would still come home and do that for fun. It's completely addictive and it's it's almost a little scary. <laughs> right on. Um, all right. Uh, hi, Michael. I want to hear your advice for 3D modelers, props, vehicles, and buildings. Uh, better to start with a tool like Maya slash Max or to jump into ZBrush first? You know, it's what you're comfortable with and 
uh, you just have to. I, I tend to use Zebra and I, I say as a crutch, but it's just a design tool for me. And I know how to kind of warp stuff around and smooth stuff out to where I can get a pretty good idea of what I, where I want to go. Now, that doesn't mean I have to stay in ZBrush for sure, but I do tend to design in ZBrush just because it's so fast. Um, but I mean, I've, I mean, look around the internet. There are people who do amazing stuff in XSI, Maya, 3D Studio Max. I mean, they tackle all the problems with their own solutions. So, I mean, I could probably make an argument an argument for any program, but at the same time, I can't make an argument for any program because I've seen amazing people do amazing things in every single one of those packages I've Blender, every single one of those packages I've ever I've described. So I forgot the question again, but <laughs> it sounds like I, I, I guess. Well, I'm going to ask another question, which kind of feeds into that, which is: Would ZBrush be good for environment modeling? Um, or is it strong as for character modeling? Um, you know, it's kind of how you want to do it. Um, I do everything in ZBrush, so it's e easy for me to say, oh, just use ZBrush. In fact, on Sway, uh, I shouldn't call it Sway, it was like Halo 2 Anniversary, I think. We did a uh, an environment. Oh, you know what? I should look this up while I'm talking. Um, anyways, I, I concepted the whole thing out. Halo 2 and I wish I remember the name of the map. And um, I basically concepted it out uh, just as a 3D model in ZBrush. And we're talking, it, was, it had like a gigantic tower. Um, it had a base that was like an oil rig with like towers over there that you can go hop on. And, uh, you know, I, a little bit of terrain and a little bit of things poking out of the terrain. I just went through and just bit, did a really, really fast uh, concept past. I think it's called Relic. And we just basically use that to go ahead and just, here we go, this map. So this one right here was concepted completely in ZBrush. And then, of course, no people took those things, the ideas in the block out, basically, and just, just went through and just killed a really good environment artist, went in with photogrammetry and did the terrain and the really good uh, uh, water guys went in and did the water and the really good skybox guys went in with the skybox. But as far as like the base modeling, for the concepting and the scaffolding and the floor design and all this stuff done in ZBrush and just kind of riffed on that. And it worked out really well because you can just, you can actually get the rough in and then go run around your ZBrush sketch. I'm trying to find ours, but um, yeah, like even this, uh, this is a work in progress shot, but um, this big crash ship over here was like, just like in a day, sketch it out from the original block out was like, because this is such an old, game that we up it was like you know 150 polys you know then we're gonna take that to like eighty thousand polys um but just going in there and sculpting this out putting it in having people run around and shoot each other around it and go and jump on it and play on it and go okay everybody happy with this and then you put in your time uh, to make it sing so i've used it for everything uh, i used it for this tower to kind of block it in and crumble it up and all that good stuff so yeah, use it. Use it for everything, man. If if cool. you're so inclined. Yeah, I completely agree. Um, it's just it's based on your preference at the end of the day. But mm -hmm. um, but yeah, you could definitely. I've seen some amazing stuff. Uh, the guys are doing at a uh, at Weta as well as uh, at DreamWorks. It's like you know just using ZBrush for you know just only ZBrush for you know creating environments. So um, if you're able to get something like what Michael has on the screen, in terms of just complex hard surface, you know. Um, you know, uh, model like what you just have, then creating, creating a, a rocky terrain. Um, like <laughs> you is can a no probably greater. extrapolate this information <laughs> into like a rock. Yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. <laughs> so, um, do you have any suggestions to achieve a nice face sculpt? Uh, observation, man. Um, and actually, uh, I, I work for a guy, so we we were going to talk about this a little bit. So. Here, here's a really easy way to make a nice face sculpt. Get some scan data. So <laughs> we do use a lot of scan data. We use it at Tiburon. So when you when you go and you need to do a, the entire NFL, it's really nice and easy to get likenesses with scan data. Now, this is very, very nice scan data. Um, but any, I mean, there's free scan data you can download. I think uh, 1024 has a really good scan data. Um, 3DSK, I think, has scan data now. So get that. Now, that, that's not to say you can't use photographs and stuff, especially if you're doing a likeness, but oh my God, these things, let me turn my Wacom tablet real quick. These things are so useful 
for just because in anatomy, in anatomy book, you get this and you get this and you get this and that's about it. But when you get a scan model, you can go, what does the collarbone actually do? What does the draft of the face actually look like? Like when's the last time you saw a photograph of like this angle and been able to kind of just do this and go look at things? You know, same thing with this thing. These are invaluable to, I think, I think a character artist, just as reference, just to go like, you know, um, one thing I got blasted for yesterday from my boss was how the nose works. And all this stuff is just really, really nice, man. And you don't, you don't get photographed. And again, like I said, a picture is worth a thousand words. Dude, I would take a scan model over a thousand pictures any day. Because you, yeah, I mean, you can actually put this behind and just start sculpting with it in the viewport. Yeah, and it's great to it's I, I actually just download or you know, just yeah, download a lot of scan models just to study them, right? Yep, absolutely. Um, you know, it's just an amazing reference. Uh so yeah, I completely agree. Yeah, rib cage and knees. Now that's now now I say this is actually very, very good scan models. We've gotten some total crap scan data just depending on the source or if the guy started smiling halfway through or one eye's closed and it's like there is some cleanup involved. Um but once you get the basics down and projecting low res to high res and then going in with your cool skin brushes, it's really not that difficult to get a really good looking head. In fact, I'm going to do a little plug for the boss I was talking about. Um, so he, it's Tony Reynolds, and this guy, does, he's my boss, but he does really, really amazing head sculpts. And he's the one who's kind of taught me. So use scan data and maybe get to know and talk to some people who are really, really good at just killing it with portraits and skin shaders and sculpting wrinkles and details and maybe ask you what brushes do you use? What techniques do you have? Because that's helped me immensely. And this guy's amazing. Great stuff. Yeah, he's really good. Disgustingly good. <laughs> right on. So um, with the extremely competitive market for 3D artists, do you suggest working? Uh, you know what, I'm gonna skip that question for a little later and just continue focusing on some of the more ZBrush uh, questions. Uh, all right, so this one is another one as it relates to, to hard surface. So I'm gonna skip that. Favorite method for posing characters and creatures? Uh, again, I'll, I'll, I'll use this one again. I, I like to hand it off to the posing rigging department and have really cool poses because they're better at it than I am. But having said that, in ZBrush, um, Subtool or uh, Transpose Master is pretty good if you have it set up correctly. Um, I sometimes do get lazy and just kind of mask and transpose depending on what I'm working on. Um, but ideally, you've got a nice cinematic model or a nice gamma's model that goes onto a rig. and Because that's when you can do the really fun stuff. You can get in a nice cool idle. And I'm trying. what I'm trying to do, actually, if you watch my GDC presentation, a big part of it is making that process, that pipeline process, like you'll see here, I have like, you know, get this thing in the game in five minutes using Houdini and tech art and magic. That's magic to me, but it's not, it's not magic, but it's basically alleviating some of the, the, yeah, you can get kind of bogged down in the production pipeline where it's like, okay, I did a really cool high res model and now I'm going to work on UVs and low res and rigging and waiting for the next two, three, four weeks just before I see this thing in game. So we're trying to fine tune that pipeline. So it's a little bit more, hey man, just make art. And the rest of it is taken care of either procedurally or in a way that has really, really good tools. So it's actually fun to do. Um, but yeah, ideally, man, you have a rig, you have some maybe canned animations or some mocap or a library of stuff and just... Um, what's the best practice for beginners when we're talking about painting and texturing in ZBrush? Uh, explanation of normal maps and how it works and how to make good ones. Gotcha. Well, uh, I do go into, I think an in intro to ZBrush part three, I go into baking maps out of uh, ZBrush. I don't generally do that. I'd like, the thing about ZBrush is you can't have an arbitrary mesh. Like you can't say, here's my high res and then here's a completely different low res and then just bake the difference. Um, you have to have subdivision level one has to be your low res and subdivision level whatever has to be your high res and then you can bake between those, which isn't a deal breaker at all. You can actually make an arbitrary mesh, project, divide, subdivide, project, subdivide and get all the detail back and then you're good to go. Um, and I mean, I go over it, but I tend to use um, X normal for that. And it's once you get into the production side where it's like 
making maps and texturing, it gets, I don't really use ZBrush for texturing. I use non-destructive things like uh, Substance Designer, Substance Painter to do all the texturing. That's not to say you can't texture in ZBrush. And in fact, I think you can, I mean, you can poly paint. Um, let me see, intro to ZBrush art. Let me go to my videos here. So for example, um, part two, if we go all the way down to bonus reptile polypaint, um, you can see me basically going through and doing the polypaint process. Now, the cool, fun thing about the polypaint process is it's very, it almost feels traditional. Like the same way uh, they text, like Gino Acevedo on um, Lord of the Rings or Jordi Shell or all those traditional guys, when they go in and paint something, they just layer up paint. And in polypainting and ZBrush, it's the exact same thing. You go in, you model a surface, you kind of build up layers on your skin and you go in and paint that way. Now, that's just for a base color and it's destructive because you know, you're just painting and you're not painting to a texture map and layers. So I don't know that I would definitely, I would necessarily use it. It's fun as hell to do. And I do it for fun anyways, just to kind of get a feel for how my character is going to look. But at the end of the day, I'll go into substance painter um, or I suppose Mari is a little bit less destructive. And, uh, but that's not to say you can't paint other maps in ZBrush. You can bake out a poly paint like this, but you can go in with like a black or a white object and paint in, uh, cavity maps or you can paint in spec maps you can paint in translucency maps in zbrush just using poly paint and then bake it off later okay cool and speaking of just since we're talking about texturing um how do you approach uh how do you handle uvs i handle them using a lot of different programs um my favorite one that i've just been using for years is Hedis. um I use a lot of Hedis UVs. Now, ZBrush does have UV Master, which is actually pretty decent considering how loose, it's, it, I, loose isn't the right word, but it's very actually artist friendly. You basically go in and you just kind of paint where you want to attract your seams. You paint where you definitely don't want seams. You can paint where you want more resolution, where you want less resolution. And you don't even have to pick edges. It does it for you and it does a great algorithm and lays them out for you and throws them into a 3D view that you can then move the shells around, rotate them however you want. Uh, so UV Master is cool and we'll definitely, you know, hit that out. I'm not sure what part of ZBrush that was in um, off the top of my head, but uh, yeah, UV Master. I use Hedis. I use my, I clean up in Maya, my UVs, but it's kind of like retopologizing. Like, oh my God, how many retopologizing and UV programs are out there? like a hundred so quite a few yeah cool uh how do you approach sculpting hair for a character uh okay so sculpting hair we did a little bit on dcuo um if i'm doing actually hair hair i don't is going to maybe sound surprising to some people i don't actually use fibers fiber mesh for doing hair sculpts and that's because it's a little bit limiting um i do want to do a tutorial because there's really amazing hair things you can do in ZBrush. But basically what I'll do is I use a program called, oh boy, it's been so long since I've used it. It's a program in Maya, it's a plugin. And it basically, uh, it's like H2MA, hair to, hair to Maya, something like that. And basically what I'll do is I'll drag out hair strips and I can do a demo on this too really quickly at the very end where I just drag out hair strips and then convert those hair strips in Maya to more hair strips, more hair strips with different styles. So I can get flyaways, um, splines. If I want to do like a cinematic render, I can, I can transfer them to anything in Maya once I get the nice cards drawn out. And I think the power of ZBrush isn't necessarily drawing on the strips because you can do that in any program, but ZBrush is pretty nice. But when you go and look at a hair tutorial, at least back when I was looking at hair tutorials, it's always like, here's how you make a 1950s Hoosiers coach haircut, you know, and it's like, okay, that's the easiest haircut you can possibly do. But that's all anybody ever does is because hair's a little bit tough. But in ZBrush, uh, I can show you a couple different things at the very end where you can actually, you know, how braiding is kind of like, ooh, how do you braid a hair? We're using splines. Good luck combing that into shape, right? Don't do that. Do it in geometry, convert that geo to splines, and now you've got braided hair. You want a Viking dude with a beard that's all like Celtic knots? don't try and comb that into a knot, you know, model it into a knot, convert those polys into hair, and then you're off, off to the races. Cool. So uh, what's the difference making a model slash mesh for a game, 3D printing, 3D printing, um, or freehand art model? Well, a freehand art model just being like a concept sketch that you just kind of yeah. model. Um, it's, so the, 
just the art model is probably the most free for you to just kind of do whatever you want because at the end of the day it's just going to be a screenshot that you paint over or just a turnaround um for 3d printing there are a couple of rules you need to look at and basically and I actually have a 3d printer and I, ah, man i should have brought it in i had some really cool 3d prints of the reptile dudes but basically you just need to look out for no open meshes and zbrush actually has some really good let me see z plugin 3d print uh, they have a 3D print exporter that has a lot of cool options, STL import and um, export. Uh, you basically just want to look out for no open meshes. Um, when you're 3D printing out something, you probably want to break it up into different pieces with key registration so that you can fit it back together later just because printing one big thing out you know, with supports and all that stuff can get a little bit... Uh, tricky not to say you can't do it because uh, i've seen amazing things get printed out in just one big chunk that's like wow 3d printing how does it work but you know you got to kind of look and maybe break down your model joseph just just uh pixel logic does a lot of uh, great toy breakdowns where it's like here's here's how you put a toy hinge into these two things and then print it out and then now you've got a you know a gi joe hinge for your you know 3d model and stuff um and the first one was a game model how yeah that? yeah so a game model is even more unforgiving and that's basically the most unforgiving asset you will work on um, because in games it's not like movies where it's for the shot so if you don't model the back end of it and it's only going to be it's going to have motion blur on it's going to be flying through the frame it's going to be covered in dust and dirt and whatever it can just be a, a blob basically not to say that playing in film is all that it's just sometimes you can kind of take shortcuts in video games you can run up to everything and rub your face on it if that's what you're into. And believe me, environment artists and character artists are totally into that during playtests. They will run up to everything and evaluate everything on a micro level for every asset. And you can't stop them because of the game. They have control of the camera. So you got to be a lot more careful. And that's, I don't know if it's like an intro to ZBrush thing, uh, but it's, it goes into a, like a production thing of like, man, here's here's game res 101. Let's, let's talk about the do's and don'ts and... You know, making smart decisions on your UVs and all that stuff. Tech, cool. Textile density. Yep, I think that answered that question. So um, when you're creating characters, um, are you always thinking about topology and base your designs with a good topo in mind? Or do you just go crazy with, you know, creative freedom and worry about retopologizing later? I would say I go crazy every time with a caveat. Now, you know, you know how sometimes you get a concept and it's like, man, I can't make... 80,000 cylindrical spikes on this dude because I have a poly count to worry about. Stop doing that. Um, same thing in 3D where it's like, you know, pick and choose your battles, you know, sell the idea of a silhouette breakup that works without going too nuts. I, I can't put a million polygon character in the game, at least not this year, but maybe in five years, who knows. But as of right now, you do kind of have to think about that as an overall design thing. Um, but really like as far as like, micro managing my topology as I work? Not at all. Um, again, with another caveat I'll get to in a second. Um, it's basically just getting my shapes and forms down when working and getting it in engine and evaluating it. And then I'll go through and be like, okay, everybody's happy. I could put my details on there. Now, now I will think what is the best way to break this thing up, plot my points, and that's my topology. Now, if I am going to be baking maps, I want to make sure that my high res doesn't have any kind of weird stuff like huge holes that I have to like put a lot of polygons into an internal surface. I'll kind of try and cap that down in there, you know, so it bakes correctly uh, on a pouch, for example. If there's like a little separation from the pouch and the back of the pouch, I'll kind of maybe squeeze those together just so I don't have to waste 70 polygons in the back of a pouch just to get it the bake right, you know, that kind of stuff. Just production -y stuff but for the most part no with two caveats cool all right next question do you think it's possible for someone with no art background to be able to produce great 3d sculpts in zbrush absolutely and in fact i mean like i said before even if you if you don't have an art background you're probably to me be the easiest person to teach zbrush because you don't bring any not, I don't want to say bad habits, but you don't bring any preconceived notions to the table. I show you ZBrush. I ramp you up in ZBrush in a very linear fashion in a way that's easy to digest. And now you're a sculptor, you know? Um, you certainly don't have to be like an amazing artist to start creating art. In fact, 
I don't know anybody who's, who, who has done that. Certainly not me. Um, and I'm certainly not even an amazing artist now, even as I speak, I'm still learning every day, uh, tons of stuff every day. Um, but you got to start somewhere. So, you know, grab the right tool and just start doing it. Cool. Um, all right. Is uh, and I know we we actually I'll save the uh, this hard surface question uh, for when you do the demo. Um, how useful do you think this tool is for other fields of design? Ooh, good one. So and and could you list some of them? Yes, actually, uh, no, I'm not going to list any, but I'm going to let Pixelogic <laughs> list it for me because they have that already. So if you go to um, well, first of all, here's Pixelogic, and I actually did some videos for Pixelogic. These are a little dated. Um, but there's sculpting with Michael Pavlovich. And I did this weirdo insert mesh creature. Um, just FYI, if you go to the Pixelogic classroom, there's some of my stuff in there. Um, but if you go to the Pixelogic website, and they have, where was that? Community. There's somewhere on here. Oh, here we go. So 3D Industries. So movies and effects, games, illustration, advertising, 3D printing, scientific, vehicle, jewelry, education. Like if you look at the top row of ZBrush, they're really good about spotlighting just, I don't want to say weirdo industries, but just industries you wouldn't necessarily think about as being like, oh, yeah, I use ZBrush to make this. And it's like, wait, you use ZBrush to make that chair? And it's like, well, yeah. And then we get it made, and it's really cool. Or medical, you know, uh, medical uh, 3D sculpts of medical stuff for illustration purposes. Lots of really cool stuff in here. So, yeah, go to uh, ZBrush, pixelarch.com, ZBrush industry. And just click through here, man. There's tons of advertising. Is another one where he, 3D models for advertising. Go make a Nike shoe. Oh, all right. So, what other software would you recommend um, to complement ZBrush? Oh, that's another good one. Um, man, uh, all of them. I, I, yeah, I mean, I I, do, I use ZBrush, but. Really, I mean, I I might be out of the order. I like learning new tools, so I would use like Marvelous. Like ZBrush doesn't have a cloth, so you can sculpt cloth, but use Marvelous Designer. People do that all the time. Use um, a simulation for uh, dynamic curves or water to do stuff too. Um, dynamic destruction. If you don't want to sculpt it, you can go to Houdini and just knock your thing over and destruct it and take it into ZBrush and do some other stuff. Um, yeah, uh, I I use Maya and ZBrush mostly, but that doesn't mean I don't use everything else to kind of pick up where either pick up where ZBrush le leaves off, or like you said, just supplement ZBrush's abilities with a little bit extra. Cool. All right. So, what do you think the learning curve for ZBrush is? I am always told. ZBrush has a very high learning curve and maybe it does. And maybe I have like rose colored glasses when it back when I was kind of learning ZBrush, but I, I you watch my intro to ZBrush course, uh, part one. And I think I haven't, nobody's said anything differently to me. And if it's terrible, let me know, please. I'll change it. But I think it's linear enough to where that learning curve isn't as high as you think, as long as you don't try and go too fast too soon. And I would say that about any program. It's not just ZBrush, but like, you don't start off Maya and go, okay, here's how you make a cube. And then you ask, well, how do I animate a mech? And it's like, well, hold on. We just made a cube. Let's uh, extrude a face. And then we'll get to how to animate a mech when that's relevant. Same thing in ZBrush. You know, you got to start somewhere, get comfortable in ZBrush. And that's what part one is all about, is just getting comfortable. And then after that, you can start asking a little harder questions about, how do I do this crazy thing? Well, from what you know and what I can tell you, Here's how I would solve that solution in ZBrush. Cool. What are some of your favorite tools or shortcuts to use in ZBrush? Oh man, I got a lot. So first part of part two is me using this custom menu that I made. Uh, because like I mentioned before, if you're over here doing this in ZBrush, even if you're like a veteran user and you've got like seven menus up and you're kind of digging through all this stuff, number one, you're gonna go blind. And number two, you're not gonna get a whole lot done just because you know, you got to do so much scrolling, but ZBrush is super cool and their customization is spot on as far as I'm concerned. It's amazing. Um, everything I need is like right here. And so what are my favorites? I just go down the list. I like Dynamesh a lot. Um, I do like Z Modeler a lot. So those are my dynamic subdivisions right there. Um, creasing and uncreasing edges while I'm doing hard edge modeling. This is my poly modeling menu. 
Um, if I had to pick one, it would definitely be just the freedom of Dynamesh. And Z, Z Remesher is actually pretty damn cool too, as far as getting automatic retopology. So let's say Dynamesh, second place, Z Remesh. Cool. And the flip of that, which is, uh, what are some of the things you don't like about ZBrush? Uh, that's a really good question. I mean, <laughs> when I'm up at like two in the morning and something happens that I'm not predicting, I could probably write you a really good one. Uh, but on the spot here, you know, depending on how you use it, ZBrush can be very good to you or it can be very mediocre to you if you're trying to make it do something that it's just not made for. Uh, I've been using ZBrush so long that I don't really get too much crap from it. And that's not to say it doesn't do things sometimes where I'm like, ah, why did that just happen? But okay. those are pretty few and far between for me. Okay, cool. Um, what role, since you have the, uh, you know, you have the, uh, the scan model up, what role do you think scanning plays in character arts? Huge. You should uh, say scan, yeah, scan data. Yeah, scan data. Yeah. Um, I would say it plays a huge role. It, like what, what Manny said is just for reference for a, for a character artist is just to be able to go around a scan data model that's from an actual human being and get it into your program and zoom around it is almost a surreal experience the first couple of times you do it where you're just like, oh my God, I've never known how to make a nose like that. But there it is, you know? Um, but as far as like I was saying, when we worked at Tiburon, it's like, okay, everybody in the NFL needs to go in game. Whew. You know, it's really nice when you get something like that, scan data that you can go and snap, you know, your base model to with UVs and just snap it to the likeness. Um, same thing I'm doing on another thing where we're just, you know, you go get a model and you snap your base model to it and you get a likeness like that. Now, this, like I said, this is a very, very nice scan data, but I would still, I would still say most scan data other than just reference is probably only good for about your high or your um, low frequency to your mid range details and forms. It's great for forms. It's okay for some of the subtleties like around here, eye bags, this kind of thing, like just the subtleties of the human face. It's really good at, but then once you start getting into like, how does, how do lip wrinkles work? Um, depending on your scan data, it could almost be nothing or it could be okay. Uh, but that's where you kind of got to take the photos and just start doing your sculpting thing and using your observational skills to kind of make that pop. Cool. So do you design your own characters? Absolutely. That's one of my, well, okay. Should I say, uh, in real life, like for my nine to five job, no, but that's not to say I don't love to do it. Like what I was saying is I work on ZBrush all day at home. My favorite thing in the world is to go through and on my YouTube channel, I have a couple sped up videos of this where it's just me. Like if you want to see the making of the mech helmet, I go through, um, basically the entire making of the, the mech helmet. Now it's sped up, it's not step by step, but you can see me just kind of designing in 3D and it's it's gotta be one of the funnest things. Even hard edge stuff is like, oh my God, this is so fun to do uh, in ZBrush, just starting out with like a blob and just kind of putting this stuff on. And it's, it's gonna look nasty or kind of just like, what are you doing, dude? But it's so much fun to just go through and sketch and then start refining that sketch and just kind of starting to kind of like even already, this is like Refine 02, and it's already pretty much what I wanted, right? Now all the details aren't there, but just kind of designing as I go. And as I refine, I go look at reference for details and stuff and go, you know, look at guns and switches. And 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 while I'm doing that, I'm hopefully retaining that kind of visual language information in my head. So when I go to concept later, I can number one, either pull it from a library so you can make a custom brush with a bunch of switches or a bunch of buttons or a bunch of shapes and then apply that to your new concept sculpt or while you're sculpting, just be able to take that information that you've learned and make just like a really cool military backpack, you know, just out the top of your head because you've done a military backpack. So you kind of know how they're put together. Cool. So uh, I think uh, right now uh, we have quite a few more questions, but obviously we're not going to be able to get through all of them. But um, I know people have been asking about this hard, you know, hard surfacing demo. So, Okay. I'll feed you a couple of questions um, as you just start cranking away the demo, if that's cool with you, Michael. Yeah, actually, here. so here's a couple things just really quick. So, like, here's uh, an Anki thing that I put together for hard edge stuff, um, scan data body. Here's another kind of hard edge thing in ZBrush. 
Here's the Spartan or the Elite armor for Halo 2 Anniversary that was pretty much all done in ZBrush. Uh, same thing for this one. Um, here's So I, I was talking to Manny last night. Here's a Roman footprint that I got from a guy who does aerial uh, photo scan data of Roman burial sites, like a really, really cool stuff. So this is another thing you can do in ZBrush is just taking uh, photogrammetry from dig sites and just cleaning it up and making it presentable and usable. So that's really cool. Let me load ZBrush up again nice and clean and shut that video off. Cool. And the first and one of the questions is just talking about your class and what, you know, someone should expect from it, expect to get from it. Um, that's, I mean, I'm in it, you know, to, to speak to that, I, if you go to my YouTube channel, and I'm sorry I keep saying my YouTube channel, and my Gumroad has a bunch of free videos too, I put that stuff out there for free, so I'm not like a mysterious character who you don't know, <laughs> and then I show up for class the first day, and I'm like, psych, I'm a total hack, and then I run off with my bags of money. I have everything, I have no secrets at all. Like all, everything you want to know about me is online. Go look at it, go watch my stuff. Um, that should give you a really good indication of, you know, the level I operate at, what I know, how I present information, how I handle even questions, uh, that kind of stuff. As far as the class specifically, it's the intro to ZBrush videos I've done. Um, I do have a breakdown. I guess, long story short, it's basically the videos broken down into projects every week to get you acclimated to the tools that we're learning that week. Um, and then you'll hand it off to me and I will say, this is great. This is how I would attack. If you have a question about how to uh, approach a specific problem, because in the intro to ZBrush classes, it's a couple examples, but it's like, okay, I can make a low res pair of pants. How do I make a backpack, for example, like we talked about? Well, I can show you how to tackle a backpack with, you know, a couple different techniques, that kind of thing. So um, what I'm looking for here. So I'm going to start out with the scan body mail here because I'm a character artist and I'm super lazy. I like to start out with something that's just already done-ish. Or not already done, but just so I don't have to like sculpt the head and put a helmet on it. I'm just gonna duplicate this guy off. Cool. Delete his eyeballs and just uh, start going. Sorry about the diet. I answered that question. I'm sorry, I'm getting so bad. Uh, about yeah, well, I guess, I, I guess the other thing is um, just talking about just the component, the feedback component to it. Because okay. as you said, it's like, you know, some of the videos, you know, you already released. And so someone going in and paying for this class, what is it that they're getting exactly from it, right? So it's just to kind of highlight that. Yeah, uh, you're getting, I mean, I, I could totally understand and actually I had one of the questions on uh, my Facebook page asked like, hey, why, why am I paying for this as opposed to um, just watching your videos? And it, I, I get it, believe me. And the videos, I, I'm biased because I made them, but the videos are good. And I think if you watch them, you will learn a lot. However, if you want to kind of fast track uh, your production skills as far as like problem solving, you'll figure out problem solving over the course of your, if you're good and uh, you're into it, maybe a couple months, sometimes a couple years, sometimes you may never come across a solution that I've been using for a long time. And I will save you that time. And believe me, I am more than happy to help you save the tears and heartache, blood and guts <laughs> that I've gone through. Yeah. And obviously it's like, you know, the class is more of a mentorship in terms of Mike working with you on the different assets or the different projects that you're working on um, or issues that, you know, you're struggling with as it pertains to that week's homework assignment. Right. Um, so that's something that obviously you do not get with the videos. Um, so this is definitely an interactive session where Mike is providing you with feedback on that. I love doing that, too. Just I teach here in uh, Austin at uh, Gemini and I was just kind of riffing with my students and we just talk about visual storytelling and design and we just have fun like not, like beyond the zbrush techniques because they are what they are also just kind of breathing some life in your characters or into your prop even is just super fun to me so not only am i going to talk about like this is step one of how to do something in zbrush i will definitely I mean for what it's worth i don't know if you my opinion's worth anything to you but i will definitely go through and help you just kind of maybe explore some new avenues for your design as well cool so we'll let you just get to that demo uh, and <laughs> you can just talk throughout the session, but I'll, you know, limit the questions. And then after this demo, we'll do the uh, hair one that you mentioned as well. Oh, gotcha. Okay. 
Uh, yeah, so um, do you want to feed me any more questions or just kind of talk about what I'm doing? Uh, I would say just go ahead and talk about what you're doing. Okay, so uh, I like to, I'm going to turn these paintbrushes off here. So what I like to do, again, is start out with a human because, I mean, modeling humans is actually fun and we'll definitely get into, like, if you throw me a human, uh, I'll definitely go over, like, anatomy stuff because that's kind of fun to do too. But starting off with a base mesh when you're a character artist and you're just designing something is... It's, it's just nice to have all those landmarks in place so that I can go through and just start making something cool. Um, and when I'm just riffing on a sketch, I'm just going in with like clay brush, clay buildup, standard brush. And it's like intro to ZBrush part one is basically how I design. So if you've watched that, I'm going to get to turn perspective off for just a second. Um, if you've watched that, you probably have a pretty good idea of how I just kind of tackle like just blocking in my shapes here. And again, like we've discussed before, I'm not thinking about like, oh my God, how do I make a hard edge here for my final model? It's like, do I want a hard edge here or do I want it soft or do I want his face to go like this? You know, and as I'm kind of going around and evaluating, it's like, okay, that's kind of weird back here. Let's think about maybe doing some of this stuff or maybe I want to go into my snake hook brush and just kind of, you know, pull out to a corner. And there are some uh, techniques in here where like the move brush with move accu turned on you can like well let's pull out or make some more aggressive shapes you know getting into like character design like you want to make this guy aggressive or uh soft or what what's his story what is this is this medical equipment is he a researcher is he a you know a space marine who's gonna go shoot people in the face all day it just kind of depends on you know if he is going to be a space marine then obviously the first thing you're going to want to do is just like give him a total like punisher face and just kind of go in and be like oh, yeah now we're ready to go and you know do whatever and then once you've done that it's like okay do i like that and if i do like something like okay this headpiece is kind of nice let's refine this i'll go in here i might up that resolution just a little bit and go okay let me bring out my hard edge brushes and i use hard edge brushes for my organic modeling too and i don't really don't differentiate between them but i know that language is kind of already there so i will go in and kind of be like okay what does this thing do um it it's a vent okay let's make it a vent and i need to give it a little bit of a border here so we can change out his filters right and then i need to put some screw ports in here so we can get in there and to get his fingers in there there's got to be like a little divot so he can kind of get his fingers in there and unscrew it and then change out his filter. Now, is that dumb? Yes, because I'm riffing as we're just kind of sitting here in a five minute demo, but that's a kind of visual storytelling that's kind of nice to do and definitely look up a lot of like reference. One guy who's really good at it is uh, Mike Nash. He, his, uh, like all the mechanical stuff he does and I, I'm guilty of this where I'll just go in and just like make some crazy stuff and be like, Ooh, it's hard edge and then it's like okay and and what else you know is that a dumb design or what does it do you just do a bunch of crap thrown on it um but to avoid doing that is good and just building up a realistic shape language so you can visually tell people what this is how it functions it doesn't have to be functional like you, unless you're going to be doing like a movie prop where you zoom in on an imax and the hand comes apart and realistically um yeah, once so we've refined this one area and this is a really dumb thing, but I'm gonna go ahead and just kind of refine it a little bit more. I'm not saying I like this shape, but since we're talking about it, I'm gonna go ahead and pop this off. So I'm gonna go through here, hit control W or control alt to tighten that up, control W, go ahead and pop this thing off, split hidden, solo mode, let's do a quick close holes, do a quick mirror and weld, isolate that, bring this back, give me a little bit of thickness here. Now again, this isn't like my final model. Maybe I want to go in here with clip to kind of maybe clean this up a little bit. But now I've popped that piece off. And now I've got this thing. Let's go ahead and just uh, do a quick close holes. I'm going to do a little bit of transpose modeling instead of Z modeling here. We go in with the E scale. It's like, oh, that's gross. All right, let's just smooth it out, man. Um, because again, this is a concept sketch. I'm getting these things to kind of work together. I'm not worried about maybe i want to put a little thing in here and then put a little thing oops in here and get this to work a little bit better i'm going to make this a little bit thicker and then clay brush oops and now to kind of 
make these components look like they work together. Like, oh, there's a little scoop out and a little scoop in. And then I'm going to go step ahead a little bit faster than I normally would. But for example, if it's like, okay, I want to go to brush, insert, industrial parts, and just grab a screw and just go boop, done, high point split hidden. Go ahead and pop that thing out. And now we've got like a little screw, you know, or a little lever. Um, if I want to completely rebuild this thing, at that point, I would go ahead and, I mean, I, I'm, I'm just constantly upping the resolution as I'm making decisions. You know, mm -hmm. maybe I'll pop this panel off and hard edge model it and Z modeler, or I'll retopologize it with my retopologizing tools and go ahead and like crease a nice shape out of it. So I have a nice shape that I can go ahead and I can either dynamesh it again, or I can just use dynamic subdivisions and just kind of make it look cool. But hopefully by the end, you know, you have a nice functional piece this is kind of like an enemy mine thing but yeah uh you know no, that's great that was quick i think uh looking watching you work like this i think we probably just need to do uh after the zbrush class just do one on uh <laughs> hard surface modeling in zbrush oh it's so uh, fun for, man. For, for production and and actually do it where you kind of just take us through the whole process of you know creating something like this you know um finalizing a zbrush and then creating the actual asset for for game production, but man, that's uh, that was pretty quick, dude. That's great. If I could do this for a living all day long, I would, <laughs> I would be in heaven. This right here is the funnest thing in the world to do. Oh, right on. So, all right, Mike, I think uh, that's great. Let's uh, let's do the uh, hair demo. Uh, I right. don't want to take up too much more time, more of your time. So, hey, man, I got the day off. Ah, I, I, you guys, I will, I will do this till ten o'clock at night. Never we'll do all that. day session. <laughs> never said that. Um, so to make hair, uh, let's go ahead and just make a hairbrush, and that's fairly simple. I'm going to do plain 3D, drag that out, make it a poly mesh, go into poly frame. I'm going to go ahead and reconstruct just to kind of simplify this plane out a bit and delete higher. So now I just got a simple plane. And basically what the idea is, and I'm going to go ahead and do a little bit of Z modeler. Uh, let's go ahead and do a brevel. A brevel. There we go. So basically, I want just a hair stripe that I'm going to be dragging out. Now, I, I do want some of that hair embedded into the head, so I'm going to go ahead and do a slice up here, and I'm going to go ahead and mask these points, and then just oops, transpose this back a bit so it kind of just has something to go into the head here. And now I can go, uh, I need to make this all one polygroup. And it's actually been a while since I've done hair, so if this completely just doesn't work at all, I apologize in advance, but I think it will. Uh, we'll go ahead and do an insert, single edge loop, alt. So here's my hair strand. Really complicated, right? So I'm going to go to brush, uh, go away, insert, create insert mesh, new. And then I'm going to bring my guy back. And we're going to go, okay, so that's an insert mesh. Now I got to go to stroke. We got to make it a curve brush. So I'm going to go to curve, make it curve mode. And let's practice this. We can drag that out. Oops, we got to do weld. So I'm going to go to my brush properties here, modifiers. And we're going to do weld some points and see how this works. Or stretch. There we go. And then, and you know, I don't remember. Let me bump up that curve res. There's a couple tricks. I mean, it's like I said, it's been a while since I've done hair, so there is a couple tricks. Uh, weld may or may not work on a single plane, but it's not a big deal because you can weld at the very end. Uh, so let's give this guy a cool haircut, and you're basically just going to go through here and do it like 1950s Hoosier style. Uh, you can go ahead and just make the hair strands as big or as wide as you want, and you can just keep dragging them out, dragging them out, dragging them out, whatever. And I tend to start from the back of the head, and I'll say I tend to start a little bit smaller just so I get a nicer curve and this, these are dynamically updated curves and then I can make it bigger and then save it uh, but it kind of depends on how you want to work because if you want to do like just like a really nice you know Fabio style oh that's cool just go ahead and drag that on and then you know that's your hair strand now while you have this on there you can go in with a move brush and it's isolate and just start moving this stuff around and I'll just go grab my brush again so anyway we're just going through, making some hair, making some hair. And these are just hair cards. If you want to get fancy, oh, man, do I have fancy brushes? I should have done this. Do I have hair? Fancy brushes? Yeah, we have fancy <laughs> hair brushes. So um, insert multi -met. Yeah, okay. So you want a hair that does something like this? Totally doable. There. 
Okay, now that's what his hair is. I'm gonna go inflate this a little bit. And now when I go into my um, G2, it's, I think it's called G2MH, um, Geo to Maya hair. I can take this, I mean, I have, to, I have to finagle it a little bit, but I can take this directly into Maya and convert these into hair splines. And then I can render out a gorgeous Celtic knot hairstyle. Um, where's another one? Let me see. Brush. Like here. So if I want to do like fucking badass Viking dude with like a beard that's craziness. And go ahead and I'm just going to hit six a bunch of times to kind of flush that out. So like, okay, cool. Here's his beard and I can do hair cards around that. I can go in here and just kind of be like, okay, here's my hair. And then I can go in here with inflate, maybe kind of inflate that up so it looks just like knots. And now I can convert that to geo, or I can convert that to splines, or I, or I can convert that to more hair cards if I want in that program. Um, so that's, that's, that's a really cool thing that you can do that would be incredibly tedious to <laughs> comb that into place. Now, <laughs> I, I'm sure like at places where they have like entire teams dedicated to making awesome hair for movies, they have uh, even more amazing solutions, obviously. Um, but for just like a really quick one, like in ZBrush, that's not too shabby. Now I'm doing a really crappy job of just kind of putting in the hair, but I think you get the point where it's just like going in and laying your cards in. Come on, there we go. Um, and I start from the back, just so I can kind of go to the go to the front. And if you want to like a part in his hair, you got to kind of decide. Oh, you know what? I totally forgot to do. Here's what I forgot to do. Here's here's another thing I like to do. Duplicate this guy off. And let's go ahead and let's him. I also like to just really quickly kind of block in what I want my hair to look like so I know how to drag my cards out. Oops. Yeah, so instead of free forming it, I like to go, you know. Like maybe Game of Thrones warrior to uh, 1950s Hoosier coach to Mad Men to Mohawk doesn't matter. Go in here and kind of determine, and this is just observation too. Just being like, okay, I want a part on his hair here, and this is gonna gonna kind of go over. There we go. And now I know how to drag my hair cards out. You know, or if he wants like, let's make him like totally art rocker style. Like, what's up, dude? So now I have that base sculpt, and now I can go ahead and drag cards on there to determine my hair flow. But he's, he's looking pretty cool, too. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, does that make... Cool. Oh, so I mean, okay, it's just to kind of just take this to the next step. Uh, let's say you got your hair cards all beautifully laid out. There are a bunch of different poly groups. That's not good. So what I'm going to do is isolate this guy. I'm going to do a quick split hidden. And now I've got my hair here. Uh, let's say I want my knots to be separate from my hair. So I'm going to grab this these three these things here and split those off. And now I've got my hair cards here. I can just go ahead and do a quick, um, make it all one poly group. Uh, I'm gonna just very quickly do a, I can do it here, uh, weld, do a quick weld point so that when I do an auto groups, now I've got individual hair cards and I can very quickly go in, if I need to move these things around, go to boop, 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 auto masking mask by poly groups up to 100. And now I can just very quickly go in and just manipulate each one of these depending on which one. I grab first. So it's really easy to go in and like style and move stuff around if you want to, or if you don't wanna, if you wanna move them all around at once, just turn that off and, or you can turn on topological and that'll do the exact same thing. So a lot of different solutions for a lot of different problems. Cool. So, and a couple of quick questions um, before we take off. Um, what advice would you give someone who's thinking of changing his career um, and starting uh, going on this path of 3D slash 2D design? That's a good question. So the good and the bad, well, okay, so I'm not going to get into like socioeconomics and political stuff and job markets, you know, because it's not like the game industry or the film industry isn't um, affected by, you know, you know, you have to have a bachelor's degree now to get a job at to a drive through, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but the good news is if you've got a strong portfolio, at least for what I do, it's not, I, I can get a job. You know what I mean? So the bad news is it is a very competitive market, but the good news is since it's portfolio based 
and you're not like a complete weirdo to work with, you will do fine, I think. That's just my opinion. But if you've got a strong portfolio and you're easy to work with, you'll get a job. Yeah, I, I, I would second that in a heartbeat. I completely agree. I mean, um, and, and Michael and I were talking about this last night. It's like, you know, until until you could go on some of the job boards, you know, that exist and are like, oh, man, there are no jobs at all for modelers or, you know, character artists. Uh, until that happens, you know, that's when it's, you know, then it's official, right? Then it's scary. Like, oh, man, there's just no jobs out there because they're taken out. But you could look at any of these job boards in any of these company websites and they're constantly looking for artists. Uh, they're looking for a amazing artist and that's, that's what it is, you know? And so, but I think it's, it's, it's out there. Yeah. It's a competitive market, but you know, um, Michael doesn't have a problem getting work. I don't have a problem getting work, you know, someone like Fausto or Pete Zoppi or, you know, a lot of these guys, it's like, you know, they don't have problems getting jobs, uh, because they're amazing. So, um, so yeah, so I completely agree with you, Michael, on that point. Cool. Sweet. So, um, and this is a question in terms of just staying focused, which some of the some of the guys uh, on the chat have already answered. But how not to sink into a vast amount of information, tutorials, tutors, articles? How to stay focused uh, now and in time when you're learning? Um, you know, that's a, that's a really good question, and I don't know that I have a great answer because I have a hard time kind of staying focused. One thing that kind of helps me is and i i wish i could do it more but i'm not that and this is gonna sound terrible but i'm not that active on forums and i would I, I love giving back to the community that's why i have my youtube channel and it's just full of videos and just like here watch me uh have fun but as far as i, I will i will take my i will pick my head up and look around every once in a while because it's important for you to do so you're not in a rut and you're not not learning um, and you're getting new techniques and new solutions because they're coming out like our industry is like crazy every four years in the game industry it's like a 180 it's a complete change just forget everything you've learned because we don't do it that way anymore and if you don't go along with that flow you're gonna be a dinosaur um and you know it's it's i, I shouldn't say that but it, it it's very easy to get kind of lost but at the same time it's very easy to get bogged down like you said because it's, things are changing so rapidly it's like how do you how do you know when to stop working not stop working but how to know when to invest your time in a new technology and that's just something you got to fill out with your schedule man um, i'm lucky yeah. enough at certain affinity to where they're very uh they're very easy going with me personally because if i find something and my gdc presentation talks a lot about this where here's a new texture solution we're on the character team, we got to solve this problem. They will give me time to explore things because they trust me because I've gone through and I've gone and I've used different programs and I've gone, okay, this works. I think this will work for the solution. We're gonna try it on this little sandbox thing here. And if it works great, we'll you know roll it out to everybody. I'll do a little tutorial, we'll do a little class. Uh, and that's worked so often that I think that's just kind of you know what we can kind of do now. But mm -hmm. it's really, you're right, it is a difficult, thing to kind of manage is like how do i know when to pick my head up and get get buried and invest the time because again you can easily get into a rut where you're just working on one thing in one way you've got your hammer with no other tools in your tool belt the next thing you know you're unemployable because what you used to do with that awesome hammer is now it's a relic you know you yeah. don't want to be that guy yeah and this would be the last uh, question uh any tips for a beginner uh, for a beginner that um that you faced um, when you first began? Yeah, um, a really, uh, so <laughs> real, okay, so I got two things. A uh, really good one is that nobody is ever just going to give you anything in this industry. Uh, and not, and that's not to be like a mean thing, like, oh, they're always it's political and they're gonna stab you in the back. And that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is if you want something, you have to prove you can do it. No one's gonna ever take you at face value. Maybe they will if you're like best buds, but even then it's like, I'm not going to stick my neck out for a best bud if he can't prove to me because that's my name too, right? So if you want something in this industry, if you want to go from environments to character art, you got to kill it on character art before they're going to go, all right, man, if you just show an interest, that's fine. Uh, but if you really want to sell it, and this is almost for anything, 
if you want it, you have to sell it. You have to sell that you can do it. And then it's e it's an easy decision for management. It's an easy decision for leads to go, hey man, at first I didn't think he could do this, but he totally just killed it on this thing. I'm I will I would be more than happy to kind of work with you to get you what you want. Uh, if you don't do that, don't expect much. Um, another thing is this industry. If you're you will be sitting on your butt all day, so don't be like me. Like my weight has fluctuated up and down. Do something active because it's going to keep your brain firing on all cylinders. It's going to make you feel better. And you just, ha it's something you have to make time for because your body will deteriorate like crazy when you're sitting in your desk for 10, 12, 14 hours a day. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and Sue, hopefully that answered, you know, your question. Um, it, it's a very, it's a very general and vague question to an extent, you know, um, because there's just so many different things. So um, we're going to be obviously doing this again. Um, this is something we want to try to do every week. Um, and if, if you're, you know, if you're around, um, I would definitely, you know, advise you ask that question, but be more specific, um, you know, as to, you know, as to which aspect of being a beginner, whether it's like your first job, your portfolio, you know, demo reel. So the more specific you are with your question, uh, the more specific we could be in terms of answering it. Oh, that's true because yeah, I'm just thinking about that now. I could totally answer that as like beginning modeler. You yeah, know, that's... exactly. Exactly. <laughs> Sorry about that. Sorry if that uh, didn't. No, not question. a problem at all. Not a problem at all. Well, guys, uh, thank you again. Um, you know, for joining us and 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 Michael, thank you for being you know just an amazing uh, amazing presenter and just just sharing your knowledge with us. Um, guys, uh, I've sent you the link for the classroom uh, to check out Mike's you know to check out Michael's class. Um, definitely let us know if you have any questions. Um, once again, we're going to be doing this, uh, you know, a lot more and providing you guys with, um, access to a lot of these amazing artists and talking about what, you know, what makes them so good. So, um, thank you again. Uh, it's Friday, uh, for people who are here in the States, have a great weekend. Uh, and for everybody else who's currently enjoying their weekends, uh, continue to have a good one. All right. So you guys have a great one and uh, we'll catch you in the next session. Awesome. Thanks, guys. Thanks again, Michael. Thanks.